Comparing his life as a mixture between the Truman Show and being in a zoo, he said of his family, I've seen behind the curtain. I've seen the business model. I know how this operation runs, and I don't want any part of it. Well, you've seen the way the business model runs at Megan's show. Okay, how about that zoo you're living in? You feel okay with that one? Is that the business model you want to be a part of? Is that the show that you want to be dancing in? Hey, how are you? Welcome to another episode of Revenge Review. And we are almost done with this book. This is our third to last episode. So we've got today, then we'll have two more episodes after this, and then we're done. Um, Now, our last episode was on the Oprah interview. And if you're like me, I figured the book probably peaked there. I was like, it couldn't get crazier than that. And I was like, okay, we're gonna have to slog through these last chapters. <laughs> I had not figured on this chapter, friends. I had not figured. Um, this is a weird chapter because it's called backlash. But really what it is, is Harry and Meghan's response to the backlash, you know? So it's not like the whole world, you know, we're not talking about what the whole world thought because we kind of already did that in the end of the last chapter. This is really more like Meghan and Harry really digging into their decision to be destructive people and then continuing to live the lies that they are these put-upon victims. So I continue to be shocked. I continue to be annoyed that I'm still shocked. I keep being amazed at how willing everybody is to play into their delusion. How many people are willing to be like, yeah, you know what, you're right. When every conceivable indication would say they're wrong. Uh, it, it was collective madness. And I'm so happy that we're coming around to a point where it just feels like we are, as a society, sort of groping our way back to the light. I mean, we're stumbling. It's a slog. We're falling down a lot. But we see a glimmer of hope. And enough of us are trying to make our way over there, back to truth, back to what is good. And Harry and Meghan don't fit the bill anymore. But I really am glad that we're going through this book right now because I think it's very easy to think, oh, the world's such a dark and terrible place. Nothing's ever getting better. Friends, it's getting better. Harry and Meghan are losing all the ground that they had gained at this point uh, when we had just collectively lost our mind. And the fact that we can all look back, and it wasn't that long ago that they had so much power. It hasn't taken us that long to flip and to go, hey, you know what? We don't like those people. They are liars. They are not truth tellers. And collectively as a society, more and more people are getting comfortable calling out what is not true. Now, like I said, we've got a long way to go. We have a lot of people who still want to live lies and still want to talk about, you know, if it's just your truth, if that's how you feel, I support how you feel, even if it's totally and colossally not so. But I do think that there is a contingency of people and a greater and greater contingency of people who are unwilling to propagate and perpetuate and uphold other people's false versions of reality as the gospel truth. We're just not as willing to do that anymore. And that's great. And that's good. And we need to pursue those things that continue to say, this is the light. This is the darkness. We need to go to the light. So Tom Bauer begins this chapter by saying that Megan, who spent so much time with her current husband and her ex-husband telling them about her tragic childhood in which she was completely and totally alone and had no siblings you know yes those half siblings of hers but you know they don't count because they didn't care about her and she was so alone all her life this was the tale she told and yet she is now raising a son and is soon to have a daughter where they will also be alone it'll it's just meg and harry and the two of them and doria whenever she decides to drop by which seems to be quite a lot But Megan has effectively made for her children the same childhood that she lamented having, though didn't actually have. So it's weird. It's a weird thing that she would know it was a bad childhood to have had because she knows she can get a lot of pity for that, for having had a childhood like that. So that's the tale she tells. But now in reality, she's creating for her children the very existence that she was so grieved to have experienced. Why would she not want to do better for her kids? Why wouldn't she be so excited to have better for her kids? If she had at any point had begun to believe the lie that she was really alone during her childhood and that her parents didn't care about her and her half-siblings could have cared less, why would she not then work extra hard to make sure her children had a happy childhood? We'll never understand, Megan. We aren't like her. But Bauer is confused right along with us as to why she would want to give her children a similar fate to the one she claims to have had. 
You know, and, and he admits, you know, the Windsors were a troubled family, but no one had expected Harry to sabotage all the relationships. Were they so troubled that you just had to throw the baby out with the bathwater? In London, the public re- repercussions uh, for that interview continued for days. We're very much not a racist family, declared William, as he was doorstepped by journalists entering an East London school to promote a mental health project. Despite his anger about Meghan's denunciation of Kate, William telephoned Harry. See, this is a person who knows how to deal like a man, Okay. Are we going to make these public jabs at each other and and talk about all of our problems and put hang our dirty laundry out in the streets for everybody to come gawk at and speculate on and come, you know, feel and look at? Or are you and I going to have a conversation together and try to fix things? William was of the mind, let's have a private conversation to try to fix things. However, this went off the rail. I'm willing to try to help us get back on. Heal and mend, he agreed with Charles, was their only option before the estrangement became irreversible. Hours after the call, Gail King appeared on CBS TV. Shockingly, she decided to reveal a private conversation that she'd had with Harry. Why she felt that that was appropriate? I have no idea, except for the fact that she was given explicit instructions from Meghan and Harry to air this private conversation. We all know how they feel about people coming out and saying things that they didn't say they could say. So anytime somebody comes and speaks on their behalf, you know they got express instruction to do so. Gail King comes out and decides to let everybody know about her private conversation. Um, She ridiculed the peacemakers. How foolish of William to come and say anything to Harry. How dare he at this late date? The conversation she disclosed was not productive. Well, it could have been if it was two grown-ups talking, but it was a grown-up and a madman. Speaking as briefed by the Sussexes, Gail King criticized William's attitude. The family has to acknowledge that there are issues, and right now, nobody is acknowledging that. King went on to describe that what Meghan really hated was that the palace wanted to settle their dispute privately, yet they had not stopped false stories appearing in the media. So according to Meghan, it's so hurtful that they would even say they wanted to settle things privately when they obviously don't, because they're not stopping the media from saying all the mean things about us. Bad story after bad story keeps coming out, such negative press. And the, the royal family could stop that if they wanted to, but they just won't stop it. This is the same lie that Meghan continued to live under when she was part of the royal family. She continued to believe that the royal family could stop things for her if they, if only they would decide to get up off their fat asses and do it. But they don't control the media. So there's nothing they can do about these stories. And yet, Meghan, you and Harry don't seem to have any problem with the false stories that appeared on the Oprah interview. If anybody around here is peddling a false narrative, it certainly isn't the royal family. You know there were 17 different inaccuracies that you stated in that Oprah interview that we know of. We don't even know the the stuff that was cut out of the interview. But on air, you said 17 things that were so blatantly false that they could be called out immediately upon the end of the broadcast. It wasn't like people had to do some digging like, well, let me check on that. The palace warned Harry that there would be no more conversations or even contact if there were further leaks to the media. That, the royal advisors believed, would intimidate Harry. They were mistaken. Certain that the Oprah interview was a huge success in America, the Sussexes were set to establish themselves, not as beleaguered royals in exile, but as A-list celebrities and social activists in California. They had arrived. They believed that that interview was the key to all their successes and that with that interview, they had really settled themselves into a life of paradise and they'd never really have to work hard at it again. All their hard work was behind them. And I think for a time they were right. But people were not willing to let what they said stand for very long. The tide was behind them at that point, but they're going to find themselves drowning in a you know a few years time from now and 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 that's the time we're living in right now on the eve of her 40th birthday megan welcomed the watershed hailed by millions as an uncompromisingly authentic superstar she had defied the odds standing in the global spotlight she had humbled the royal family well that's what some people thought but though megan knew that she really had managed something at least in america i mean in england they were so over her it cannot be overstated how much the british hated her at this point but america was still uncertain of what had been thrown into their laps and we were trying to make the best of what we had we thought possibly you know there was a redemptive story behind Meghan markle maybe she was telling the truth maybe probably she was you know we do love a dramatic story here and so 
Well, she knew that she was on top. She also knew that she better make sure that the media didn't spin out of her control. She had to get a firm grip on them, vice-like grip around the throat in order to maintain control here. Nothing could be left to chance. Megan's status and income depended entirely on media exposure. Denigrating the media, and not least by legal threats, was part of her armory. At her request, CNN withdrew a report exposing her inaccuracies in the Oprah Winfrey interview. The Sussexes' skill was to deny access to anyone unwilling to fawn on their terms. In turn, their authority bestowed considerable influence across Hollywood. In Los Angeles, the media acknowledged, Megan had become a significant force. Fearful of Megan's negative influence among her neighbors and other power brokers, past associates greeted journalists inquiring about her career with aggressive silence. Their abrupt refusal to comment was a measure of Megan's new authority. And she had quite a bit of it. Megan, and I can only connect this to the cultural moment, had for some unbelievable reason, an absolute chokehold on the nation's opinion of her. She wielded an iron rod when it came to people's opinion of her. Somehow, even though she was coming out as so abrasive and so unlikable, people were afraid to say, you know, she's kind of abrasive and unlikable. She's kind of a weird liar. Some of the things she said in that interview were not normal or even realistic. You know, but nobody felt that they could even say that. Everyone had to be like, well, you know, that was her truth. So even though she's over here shutting down CNN, you know, making it so that people are afraid to speak the truth about her, you know, only her truth counts, not theirs. Even though Piers Morgan's over here losing his job because he said anything negative about her. Uh, it defies understanding why people continued to champion her, except for the fact that, you know, the phenomenon when you're in like, elementary school and it kind of goes on into high school too but I remember this first starting in like I was like probably in third grade when this started and there was a girl in my class who was so bossy and so unlikable and so pushy and yet we were all scrambling to gain some kind of standing with her you know we wanted her to like us and I remember my mom saying why do you care so much about her opinion why do you court her to gain her opinion and and I mean why do you want to hang out with her you don't like her she's mean to you and at the time I was like I know but somehow it would mean something if she liked me I'm like is that is that the thing that's in play here that people know they don't like her and yet they won't say a word against her? what would have happened if they did well I guess Piers Morgan could tell us you'll lose your job but why were people willing to fire a Piers Morgan or or anybody else who felt that it was dangerous to criticize Megan why were people willing to stand up for her like that? What had she ever done? And the only thing I can think is that it it just came down to virtue signaling. You know, you can't be mean to anybody because then they'll think that you're othering them and then it's going to be this whole thing. Why did we collectively lose our minds like this? I'm going to tell you what, that was a weird, weird time. Introduced on their insistence. As the Duke and Duchess, the Montecito Windsors had created their own celebrity image crafted in skillfully orchestrated photo opportunities as multiracial, multicultural humanitarians. Rather than service and sacrifice, their brand of royalty was shaped by lucrative political careers. The only uncertainty was Meghan's destination. Her ultimate ambition was shrouded in mystery. Yeah, nobody could figure out what she was going to do. And nobody still knows what she's going to do. Because that podcast surely was not where her money would lie. I mean, those were a dud if ever there was a dud. So that couldn't have been it. She doesn't want to act anymore. People say she has political ambitions, but I nobody's going to take her at this point. If her chance to run for office had ever been, she let it slip her by. No one's ever voting for Meghan Markle in anything. The Sussex routine had changed. Oh yeah, this is... Okay, but see, now that they feel that they can sort of let the mask slip a little... They aren't even trying to appear to be like the royals that they had once been. Because they at first they came to America and they still kind of did their little, you know, we care about humanity and we're going to pass out packages of food from the back of our Cadillac Escalade and we're going to lay wreaths and at the graves of the fallen. And, you know, you'll sometimes see us coming out, you know, with a various word here or there about a cause, a charity or you know, some sort of you know, program that sounds like it's good. But now they're not even worried about that. I mean, those that's a thing of the past. They don't have to bother with that anymore. 
Uh, but the other thing that changed too was they weren't even going to try to bother to put any emphasis on their British ties. You know, yes, they had the, you know, the British royal family. That's the only way anybody knows either one of them. But, you know, here's the middle finger to the British. Americans, would you like to meet us? We're here. With the shrewd team of advisors, they concluded that any appeal to the Britons was wasted. In the aftermath of the Oprah Winfrey show, they focused their energy entirely on America, not only to relate to their bedrock of support, but also to maximize their income. To benefit from Delaware's secrecy, Megan's lawyers had registered 11 companies in the state. And it's all so confusing, because they have Archwell Foundation, but then they also have some companies called Archwell Audio and Archwell Productions. So... There's the foundation, then there's audio, and then there's productions. What is all this? What are they doing with the foundation? Not one soul knows. And audio, you need a corporation for audio and one for productions? When, I mean, isn't that kind of like, couldn't they be sort of rolled into to one? What? Something is being hidden here. Outsiders would be unable to discover where the couple had deposited any of their income from Netflix and Spotify. Or whether their income had been used for charitable purposes. Right? So they've got all of these companies, 11 companies registered in the state of Delaware between them and Doria. But where's all this money? Where has it gone? It certainly hasn't gone to initiatives, charities, work, because nothing's being produced. And where did all the money go from Harry's book? I mean, because that's a lot of money. He is currently right now on the number th- number three on the Amazon best-selling book list as of today. So he's still up there, still selling his little book, still telling his tale of woe. Where's that money? There was no evidence that Netflix and Spotify were earning any revenues from their relationship with the Sussexes. On the contrary, executives in both corporations were reportedly frustrated by the lack of products and profits. And of course, we know how they feel about it now. They called them effing grifters is what they called them. The only revenue agreed by the Sussexes was a partnership with the Center for Humane Technology. Together with Archwell, they would research the development of safer, more compassionate online communities. This was the line. And of course, that fits their bucket list of things that they want to get done in the world. But it's not a source of money for their lifestyle. You know, it certainly was not something that was going to support them in the lavish way that they've become accustomed to. So, but that was the only thing anybody could find that they were really a part of. And that there was any, you know, that anything was being done on any front. Now, we come to the bit that just slayed me. I mean, just, I was laughing so hard at this because it's just ridiculous. All right, so Harry is over there juggling his little juggling balls outside the window while Megan does her podcasts or whatever. He clearly has nothing to do. So they've got to find him some gainful employment. So as is their want, they put a ton of people on the job to find Harry some work, right? He can't find his own job. Um, so they have a whole team who cast this dragnet among Silicon Valley billionaires and headhunters to find suitable employment for Harry. And their first catch was better up. This is the announcement that the corporation puts out after hiring Harry. Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, has been employed as the chief impact officer, delivering hyper-personalized coaching To improve motivation and productivity, Harry would oversee the corporation's counseling and mentoring services. You guys, Harry is going to oversee the corporation's counseling and mentoring services? The same guy who couldn't even tell his family that his wife was having a mental health crisis and needed to see a counselor, like, immediately? The same person who fumbled around in the darkness, not sure how to tell his family that his wife was thinking about ending it all because she was so emotionally distraught. This is the person that we've decided to put over the Corporation of Counseling and Mentoring Services after he's admitted he doesn't know what to do with people who are in mental crisis. You guys, this is like putting Hitler uh, as the director of a Jewish orphanage. Like, this is a person who cannot manage the job that he's been given to any measure of success. It's really hard to imagine a worse lapse in judgment. Despite his promise not to cast in on the royal connections, Harry offered to the California money machine his expertise as a sufferer of mental health as a prince. What? (laughs) Okay, so 
Harry's promised that he's not going to cash in on that royal title. You know, that's beneath him. He doesn't need that. You know, he doesn't need those people. It's not appropriate for me to cash in on that royal title. And I wouldn't want to anyway. But I can tell you I've suffered grievously as a prince. He wanted everybody to know that it was as a prince that he had suffered burnout. And so he would join a program to urge sufferers to seek mental wellness by meditation with the help of a better-up coach. I'm being schooled by the universe, Harry would say about finding the cure to his own personal burnout. A sufferer's mental health, he advocated, would improve if they quit their job. I mean, really, the thing that's wearing you down is work. Work's hard. Having a job is a real nightmare. You don't need that. You don't need that at all. What you need to do is just quit. Get in your bed and just rot. You know, put on a little Netflix, get yourself some snacks. Just don't get out of the bed. Why would you? Because burnout's just around the corner. As soon as your feet hit the ground, you'll be burnt out. Just quit. Give up. I did. Look how good it turned out for me. But of course, Harry never bothered to tell people, how are you going to get along financially if you don't have a job? You know, just quit. But what what are you going to do? I mean, just get on welfare? Is that, I mean, truly, Harry would know a thing or two about that because he's been living off the welfare of all his friends low these many years, you know? He quit the royal family and then he started, you know, he put his palm out. Tyler Perry, I need some allowance. You got a house we can live in or a plane we can fly in or some vacation days we could take. So, of course, for him, this, you know, just give up. Just give up. Hopefully you've got some rich friends who can help you out, though. I mean, you don't need to work, but somebody's got to, you know. So let your rich friends foot the bill for your lazy ass. But, you know, on a serious note, though, what a terrible thing to tell people who are already suffering from mental illness. To tell people who are already struggling with hope, to tell them to choose hopelessness. Because... At least if you have a job, at least if you're pursuing something, there's some hope that it could get better, you know? The whole, you know, start with making your bed thing, it's a joke, right? But it's not a joke, really, because everybody knows that if you're depressed, you should clean your room. You should tidy up the house, do the dishes. Do one small act of productivity to snowball the effect to get yourself going. If you are distraught and depressed and you look around and you see that everything's terrible, the answer is not to turn Netflix on and get a snack. I promise you won't feel better after that, you know, but that's what Harry is effectively saying. This is so, this is the antithesis of mental health to tell people to give up and to quit. To promote better up, Harry arranged that the California corporation should be linked to the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, a royal charity. So he's still using his royal connections. In order to get better up off the ground and to get people noticing it, he goes to an established institution that he's just finished maligning and saying why don't you two pair up you know the queen's commonwealth trust has got some credibility and it would make me look really good if my little you know better up thing was connected with something that had credibility (laughs) yeah you don't say harry you know you know how long they've worked to make that credible institution long time Okay, and that's what it takes. You don't just get to build credibility out of nowhere. So here he is, still trying to ride the coattails of the royal family, still trying to ride those palace coattails. He doesn't want to have anything to do with them. But could better up work with you guys? And against all odds, they did. I can't believe that the Queen's Commonwealth Trust coupled up with Harry. What a slap in the face. What are they thinking? So they did. Um, QCT promoted better up as an invaluable help to the Americans. Oh, Harry was dipping into some murky waters here. Because he's not supposed to be doing anything with the royal family. He's been stripped of all of his titles. He's denounced them. And yet, he wants the credibility that he knows they offer. Bauer says, contrary to British charity practices, nearly the entirety of QCT's total annual 796,106 income was paid to its staff rather than to list beneficiaries. Without any understanding of finance or law, Harry risked trouble. I'm not sure about all the legalities there, so I won't comment on it, but I don't know what Harry is doing just on a purely 
logical stand? Why would he denounce something and then go scurrying right back? Because he knows, the, despite what Megan says, they do have credibility behind them. Describing himself as a humanitarian, a military veteran, mental wellness advocate, and environmentalist, Harry's second position was as a member of the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information Disorder. Oh, how our two books have been meeting. The Aspen Institute, is it? Hmm, we've been talking about that in our Hunter Thompson book. Not extensively, but it's been brought up. The commission was investigating how misinformation was causing a modern-day crisis of faith in key institutions. Among Harry's fellow members on this board was Catherine Murdoch, the wife of James Murdoch, whose London newspaper had illegally hacked Harry's telephone. I mean, Murdoch claimed that he wasn't aware of the whole thing. But what? Harry's, Harry's opinion of the Murdoch specifically was real bad in spare. He denounced them as a bunch of hateful demons, really. James Murdoch, he didn't have one kind word for that man. Uh, repeatedly in spare, he spoke against James Murdoch. And yet, for a couple of bucks, he'll sit on the board with Catherine Murdoch, his arch nemesis wife, and they'll all play nice together. And they'll all talk about how there's misinformation causing modern day crisis of faith in key institutions. Yet Catherine's husband is one of the key problems in that crisis of faith. And yet Harry, who hates the man, will play nice just for some money? Like he doesn't have any standards. There's nothing guiding him, which is why I think he's just so miserable. He just cast about like a reed in the wind. But I think Harry just enjoyed getting to come out and whine and complain and talk some more about his favorite sub subject. Um, how there was a crisis of trust and truth, which is a global humanitarian issue. And how he really wanted there to be some accountability for the super spreaders of lies, which are harming hundreds of millions of people every single day. So I guess that's why he was able to ignore Catherine Murdoch sitting there right next to him, because it was another opportunity for him to whine and whinge and sing that one song he knows. But Harry doubled down. He went even further than this. He described inaccurate journalists as the pirates with press cards who have hijacked the most powerful industry in the world. He asked, if the news media is supposed to be holding us to account, who's holding them to account? I would love to see a movement to expose the unethical, the immoral, the dishonest among them. Starting with you, Harry, in that Oprah interview. Because the 17 inaccuracies in the Oprah Winfrey interview and Meghan's misleading statement to the High Court in the mail on Sunday seemed not to bother him all that much. You want to meet the unethical, immoral, and dishonest among them? <laughs> Roll over in bed, friend. She's laying right there with you. Ethics were so important to Harry that he and Meghan joined New York's Ethic Bank as impact partners. Now, you guys, I didn't know anything about Ethic Bank. Let's find out together with Tom Bauer, shall we? This bank is a $1.3 billion asset management fund. It was founded in 2015, and it focuses on sustainable investments. Their purpose, said the Sussexes, was to rethink the nature of investing to help solve the global issues we all face. Which ones? What are you talking about? The Sussexes had invested their own money in the fund, and they were paid to become brand ambassadors. Even though this was forbidden and the Sandringham Agreement. Oh, but ethics. We care so much about ethics that we have begun to put our money into a bank called Ethics Bank. That's how much we care. You know, we're going to blow past all the things we've agreed to and the, the dotted lines we've signed. Not those ethics. No, new ones. Global ones. The bank was controversial. Presenting themselves as environmentalists and hippies, the bank's founders were accused of greenwashing investments for the super rich by conjuring a do-good smokescreen. Oh yeah, I mean y'all, this is just like right up Megan's alley. Listen to how gross and sickening this is. Critics highlighted that Ethic Bank had invested in gold mines, social media, airlines, oil corporations, pharmaceuticals, Amazon, Raytheon, the precision missile manufacturer, and even Rupert Murdoch's Fox Corps all of whom were condemned as unethical by pressure groups and, P.S., by Harry himself on multiple occasions when he's wearing a different mask. So what we can surmise by this, 
is that Harry and Meghan are just a couple of effing hypocrites because they don't care one whit about what comes out of their mouth. Whatever you need to believe, okay? Just don't question us too far and don't look into what Ethic Bank really is all about. Harry is a colossal hypocrite if he is nothing else. It doesn't really surprise me he would invest with a bank called Ethic Bank, which you guys, it's a little on the nose to call your bank Ethic Bank. I mean, that's so lame. It's trying so hard to get people to buy buy the image. So it doesn't really surprise me that he would go with something so lame because that's kind of on brand for him. To be hypocritical and lame, 100% on brand. But I think that people really started to get angry with him when, especially Americans, when he came out and tried to weigh in on the First Amendment. You know, it's one thing to be a hypocrite, but then to come out and be an idiot, people are almost more offended by that. So he came out and he said that the Americans' First Amendment was bonkers. People shouldn't be allowed to just come out and say whatever they want. There should be some sort of legislation that forces people to say only the right things. Nothing in the world has ever gone wrong when you actually have somebody in a position of almighty power making sure that no one's saying what they're not supposed to say. That's the exact way a country should be led. Nothing bad can come of it. And it's all about loving people. It's loving people enough to tell them they can't speak. It's another form of justice. It's another... So, if anybody had still been, you know, waiting in the murky waters of love for Harry, some people began to crawl out of those waters and like, ooh, shark infested. Because Harry is coming out, revealing all of his ignorance and saying things that just show that he doesn't know of whence he speaks. He wants to talk and he wants to sound like a grown up. So he wants to start talking about the Constitution and the amendments and things like that. Things that grown ups talk about. But he doesn't even know what he's saying. He can't ever see the end of anything he does. That's his, that, that is his tragic flaw. You want to know what Harry's tragic flaw is? His inability to conclude the end of the statement, to conclude the end of the action, to surmise what might be around that corner, to deduce what could be. Inferences are not for him. It might be why he was such a bad student. But this is why he struggled so in life. Whatever feels good today He'll think about the consequences tomorrow. And Megan is very much like that too. Although she is all the day long guessing about what comes next, steering her own ship. But she too struggles with accurately being able to surmise the obvious. And Harry deeply struggles with that. So he comes out with this lame-ass statement about them. The First Amendment is tragically out of step with modern society. What we need is some new laws on the books that will teach people how to shut up and not say what they shouldn't say. And the government needs to get involved in that. Of course, this was Harry's way of discussing the uncensored media. And that's why he said it was bonkers. It wasn't because he's thinking about the political implications of shutting people up. It was, I don't want anyone saying anything mean or nasty. I don't want anybody saying anything mean about me or my wife. So that's why nobody gets to talk. You know, he's not thinking about what that really, really means. You know, and if you have somebody in power saying what you can or can't say, today might be the person who agrees with all of your statements. What if you get somebody else in power? They want other statements to be said, right? Think about it, Harry. Oh, well, he thought about it all right. He thought about it enough to say that the First Amendment was vulgar. And he said that it was vulgar and it was crazy. And he babbled on about that for a while until enough people in his own inner circle whispered in his ear, well, that's what an idiot thinks. So you might not want to keep on with that. You know, Um, yeah, there are people who believe that the First Amendment should have had some kind of parameters around it. But you get in murky waters when you start talking like that. And most people can see, let's just let people say what they want to say. It just showed Harry's colossal ignorance and it just highlighted how little he knows about most things. He's willing to go up, feed him the line and he will be the first one who's got his hand in the air ready to say it. 
He's such a little eager beaver, but the problem with him is that he's not really prepared to do much more than say the line. He can't defend the line, but he'll say it. You know, just tell me what you want me to say. I'll say it. I'll be the first one. There was a good reason for Harry to renew his criticism of the media. On April 16th, 2021, David Engel, the solicitor, told the Mail on Sunday that although his client, Jason Knopf, would not voluntarily help the newspaper, he would provide a statement if Megan's case came to trial. Knopf's latest approach was prompted by Judge Warby's refusal to allow a trial. Knopf was also taken aback by the Sussex's inaccuracies in the Oprah Winfrey interview as well as Megan's story that Thomas Markle was a liar who she, as a loving daughter, had tried to help. Warby, the Palace Four complained, had protected Megan's duplicitous behavior, allowing her to reduce the reputations of good people and brilliant professionals, namely the Palace Four. If the Four testified at Megan's trial, the consequences for the Sussexes would be serious. With that in mind, Harry set off for London. Well, he was going to London because his grandfather had died. But he also knows that when he gets there, it's going to be to a very cold reception, not just because of what he did with the Oprah Winfrey interview, but because a lot of people were really uncomfortable with what had happened with that judge completely protecting Megan when there had been allegations that she had bullied people. So she isn't coming off from any angle as an honest person. And yet the judge still chose to protect her, even though he'd given the impression that he would fairly look at the case. And even though the case itself was a piece of junk, which he had said it was initially. So Harry can say all he wants about the First Amendment being bonkers and crying and complaining about the media. But so far, judges have been protecting him. But there's only so much a judge can do. And then when the evidence starts coming out, and the palace force certainly has the evidence. I don't know what Harry and Meghan will do under those circumstances. But Harry was, again, not going because he needed to deal with any court situation. He was going back to London because Prince Philip had died. His funeral was set for the 17th of April. Neither the palace nor the media understood the Sussex's mindset when Harry arrived in London just before the service. Y'all, what a train wreck of a life Harry is leading. What an, what a horrible, horrible wreck of a life. And how much shame there would be in every scenario. When he's with Megan, she shames him for where, from where he came from. She acts like it's his family that has abused her so terribly, you know, so he's always having to feel like he's playing catch up for what his family has done to her. He has to constantly live in shame at being white in her circle of people being white is like the worst thing in the world. So he has to feel this shame about how he is inherently a colonizer and an oppressor. Then he's got to get on Oprah Winfrey's show and he's got to try to toe the line between what Megan wants him to say and the fact that he does have a great deal of respect for his grandmother. No, she never did him any wrong. Yet he's got to go on there and talk ugly about his family. Now he's got the pressure of the court coming out and revealing all the things he's helped, tried to help his wife to hide. Now his grandfather's dead and he's going to go. And instead of just being able to focus on how sad he is that his grandfather has died and helping his family through their grief and, you know, going and being with people who loved his grandfather and finding safety there, he's alienated the very place he could have found safety. So there's no safety there. He's grieving that his father, his grandfather's died. I mean, I'm assuming he's grieving. I don't know. He didn't care very much for the old man when the man was alive. But assuming he has any human compunction towards grief, I would assume he's a little sad about it. Where can Harry go to find genuine comfort? Not into the arms of Megan. There's too much unknown there. He has no friends. He has no family. The, the the media is maligning him. The court case the, the court cases have been won, but very unpredictable where that may lead. There's nothing that is safe. What a train wreck. I would hate to be Harry. The mood in London was somber. Daily, the media extolled Philip's remarkable life and devotion to the country. The Duke had planned a simple funeral at St. George's Chapel in Windsor. The rehearsals displayed faultless military drill. Few would not be touched by the perfection of British ceremonial tradition. The weather was forecast to be perfect. The only uncertainty was the relationship between Harry and his family. How would he cope with his father and brother? And Meghan had refused to come, citing her seven months pregnancy. 
But that hadn't stopped her when she wanted to fly to New York for that baby shower. So pregnancy has never gotten in Megan's way. And it certainly is, should not have gotten in the way today. I've flown seven months pregnant. It's not a big thing. In Windsor Castle, the Queen was preparing to face the public on one of the saddest days of her life. Oh, what a tragedy this was. Not only has she lost her husband, but she lost him during COVID. So there wasn't even any visual display of closeness with her family because she had to go sit by herself in black she's got a black mask on by herself while she watches the funeral and not only are we looking visually at what we know to be so tragic the funeral and the death of a spouse to somebody who has been married to him for 70 years her whole like more than half her life she spent with this man like a whole person's life she has been married to him and to lose him obviously so sad but we knew what was going on in the background we knew what was the turmoil and the grief that was churning in her family at a time that was already so hard and harry did that to her so here his poor grandmother is sitting by herself in grief and there can be nobody around her because of stupid COVID ru rules. And the pain in her heart isn't just the fact that her dear husband is dead, but Harry is destroying his family and seeming to enjoy doing it. In Windsor Castle, the queen was preparing to face the public on one of the saddest days of her life. Philip had been her rock for the previous 70 years. To comply with COVID restrictions, she would grieve alone inside the chapel. Thank goodness Megan is not coming, the monarch said in a clear voice to her trusted aides. There was no mistaking the queen's dislike for the disruptive actress. Harry's presence remained a problem. As a private citizen stripped of his military titles, he could not dress in his uniform, which would have been appropriate. To minimize the embarrassment for both Harry and Andrew, who also could not wear his military uniform, the whole family decided to come in morning suits instead. So every male was dressed in a morning suit instead of the military uniforms that they should have been wearing. So Harry and Andrew, once again, are disrupting everything for everybody else because they can't get their together. To avoid any problems with William, the brothers were separated as they walked towards St. George's Chapel by their cousin, Peter Phillips. So you know it must have been pretty bad between them if they thought we don't even need to put them together because they won't even be able to hold it together with the pictures being taken, the filming going on. Something could go down. So we have to place a family member between them. That's ugly. During that short procession, many watched whether Harry signaled any regret towards his family. He did keep giving these sideways glances to William and some people thought that that showed his unease. But nobody knew how nervous Harry really should have been. And he should have been shaking in his little boots. None realized that in four weeks' time, his Apple TV series about mental health would confirm not only his disloyalty, but his disregard for his family's privacy. Transmission had been delayed until after the funeral. But once again, Harry had shafted the Windsors. Oh, he should have been nervous. So not only has he torn up his family to shreds in front of the entire world with Meghan, now he's like, I didn't get enough of it. I don't, I don't feel satiated. I want to keep going. Apple TV, let's make a deal. You pay me a couple of bucks and I'll just denigrate my family to death. Looking at his family standing at St. George's Chapel, Harry knew that his damnation of them in the Apple TV series would widen the rift. Sitting alone and isolated, the 94-year-old monarch's grief was concealed behind a black mask. Everyone was moved by her dignity. William looked tense, Kate serene, Charles visibly anguished. Only Harry's expression defied accurate reporting. Slapping his order of service against his thighs as he left the chapel, he was clearly impatient. None knew that Harry, the once adored young prince, had betrayed his whole family again. By the way, I think that that's an inaccurate representation that he was impatient to leave and that's why he was slapping his program against his thighs. I think he was trying to parrot nonchalance i think he was trying to act like you know he didn't feel uncomfortable and so he's just sort of acting in a casual way maybe he was nervous yeah, and he should have been and it could have been that but i also think that he was just monkeying for the camera after the service eager for signs of reconciliation the media seized on kate's maneuver to engineer a conversation between the brothers 
Cameras followed them as they walked up the hill towards the castle. Later reports of the aftermath veered between a two-hour conversation between Harry, William, and Charles, and a perfunctory exchange before everyone departed. Few realized that Harry had no interest in reconciliation. He wanted to return to California as fast as possible. The three princes spoke briefly before Charles drove to his cottage in the Brecon Beckons in Wales. William was handing William was handed the burden of rescuing the monarchy from the damage caused by his brother and his uncle Andrew. Yeah, well, you know, we don't know here what their little conversation was in Frogmore Gardens uh, right after the funeral, but Harry wrote about it extensively in the preface of his book. And you can go back and watch that if you'd like to in that series that I did about Spare. It's the first video I did in that series, and I just remember being like, ooh, this is good. Because Harry says that he tried to get his family to understand how he hadn't betrayed them. They had betrayed him. And he was only setting the record straight. And he really believes it. He tells a lie and then he tries to get them to come right along with him. And they wouldn't do it. And they kept being like, we don't understand this. We don't get this. Like, you keep saying these things. Nothing that we've experienced together would substantiate that. That's what Megan says happened. But what you and I, what we know, we know that's not what happened. And Harry left in a huff right as soon as he could. And he refused to be with his family. He refused to be with anybody. And now, you know, having read all of Revenge, I can see why he didn't want to engage with everybody after the funeral. And I remember even in that video saying, you know, why was he not wanting to, you know, why was he pulling his dad and his brother away from the family? Why can't he just go in and have, you know, a sandwich or whatever and like be with his cousins and stuff because they were all at the house? Why was he not doing that? And now I see, well, why would he? Everyone's enraged with him. The Oprah interview was just on. And he wouldn't have been a welcome guest in that house. And I just didn't understand the timeline. But I get it now. Uh, But I also see that Harry is all the time trying to pull people away and give them his little side of the story. He's always trying to twist people's understanding of what happened. And he couldn't have told the, the, he couldn't have gotten the whole room on his side. So he's got to get his brother. He's got to get his dad. He's got to get them off by themselves so that he can try to tell them his little sad story. But of course they didn't get it. So he leaves. He's in a big fat huff. He's outraged. He, he's like, well, once again, no one understands me. No one tries to understand me. Everyone's the worst. And Palace finally understood very precisely on 14th May that the Sussexes were beyond control and beyond hope. Nobody is going to reconcile with these people now. Because, and they certainly don't want to. They have made their bed and they're enjoying lying in it. Apple TV released Harry's broadcast. It was called The Me You Can't See. Is there any of you that we don't see? We even got a special Todger edition once your book came out. If only there was a part of you we didn't see. Harry denounced William, whom he had previously praised as the only person he could trust. And later in a podcast called Armchair Expert, he dishonored Charles, whom he had previously thanked for being so kind, for causing a cycle of genetic pain that doesn't even make sense what a stupid term here harry is again trying to use the words the grown-ups use genetic pain what are you talking about are you talking about a pattern of generational abuse that's not genetic okay that is behavioral choices and you are making a behavioral choice to cut people out of your life And give your children the same inheritance that Megan claims she had. How about that genetic choice? If those are the terms you want to use. Uh, As is his want, all were cast as villains responsible for his cycles of suffering and unresolved anger. I'm outrageously angry all the time. I mean, unbelievably addicted to rage. I love it. But it's not my fault. I can't be any other way. If other people had bothered to care about my feelings, to show me any compunction of kindness and sweetness, and and had cared for my feelings when I was just a little boy walking behind my mother's coffin, I wouldn't be like this. They made me addicted to anger. It's not my fault that I love the feeling of the red mist as it comes over my eyes. It's their fault. Comparing his life as a mixture between the Truman Show and being in a zoo, he said of his family, I've seen behind the curtain. I've seen the business model. I know how this operation runs, and I don't want any part of it. Well, you've seen the way the business model runs at Megan's show. Okay, how about that zoo you're living in? You feel okay with that one? Is that the business model you want to be a part of? Is that the show that you want to be dancing in? 
Instead of being reconciled with his family, he had monetized his anguish. That's the only way to go about life, according to Megan. Money, money, money. The trigger for his anger was once again his family's total neglect of Megan. Well, she was suicidal. She was going to end her life. It shouldn't have to get to that. That was one of the biggest reasons to leave, feeling trapped and feeling controlled through fear, both by the media and by the system itself, which never encouraged talking about this kind of trauma. I was ashamed to go to my family because I know that I'm not going to get from my family what I need. Again, that statement doesn't make sense. You're afraid to go to your family because they won't give you what you need. That's that that's not that's not a cause and effect statement here. Like you're afraid of them because they aren't giving you what you need. You're just saying things at this point. Those two things don't one would actually not mean the other. You're afraid to go to your family because they won't give you what you need. No, you would be angry with your family. You'd say, I, I can't go to my family and it makes me angry because I know they won't give me what I need. You know, it's not fear, it's anger here. But he doesn't even know his own emotions. He's just, he's confused. He's bamboozled. He doesn't know what to say. He's just saying a lot of statements. He's heard them all before. He'll just throw them all out. Doesn't matter if they don't tie together. Whatever. You know, what I think it ultimately comes down to is, and this is why the statement doesn't make sense because he's not being honest about why he didn't go to them. He knew it was a lie and they wouldn't believe him. Because they knew it was a lie. They'd seen her be dramatic before. They'd seen her be theatrical before. They'd seen her act out. They'd seen her make claims. They'd seen her do so many things that were not honest. So that if now she comes up with that, they they may have said, are you sure? Are you positive that that's what's going on, right? He didn't bring it up to them because he knew that she had never acted in a way that was trustworthy enough for them to believe her now. She'd cried wolf too many times, you know, to put it succinctly. Ramping up his earlier accusations aired in Oprah Winfrey interview, Harry described how he and Meghan felt bullied into silence. I thought my family would help, but every single ask, request, warning, whatever it is, just got me met with total silence, total neglect. We spent four years trying to make it work. We did everything we possibly could to stay there and carrying on doing the role and doing the job. Megan was struggling. Even while they negotiated their departure, hunted and helpless, in London, there were forces working against us. Now, who, who rebuffed Harry's pleas? We don't know. He never identified them. No one's ever come forward. No one's ever said, yeah, there were some people who really hated Harry and Meghan. You know, we, we know exactly who this was. No one's ever said that. All we've ever gotten is that people tried to help Harry and Meghan. Yet he wants to say that they were hunted and helpless in London. The problem with this kind of language is that when there's actually a real problem, no one's ever going to believe you because they're going to be like, oh, some more hyperbole. Well, we've heard that. While the palace struggled to understand why Harry would publicly criticize the queen and his dead grandfather for the, their upbringing of Charles, I mean, these are really difficult times for the queen. How dare you come out and your grandmother is very elderly, sickness right around the corner if not already upon her, grandfather dead, and he wants to come out and be like, they were the worst parents ever. The whole family has a real problem being parents, but they in particular were the worst. My dad suffered under their egregious hand. My grandfather may be dead, but I don't mind saying that he was a nightmare of a father. The worst you've ever encountered. But while the palace wondered what was going on with Harry and why he could manage to say all these hateful things, Harry was super enjoying the fact that the whole world's attention was turned to him. Remember that social media that he hates so very much? The one that he thinks should be curbed and that the First Amendment should not apply to? Well, he's enjoying the reports that he's trending at number one on social media. Didn't mind social media then. Twitter's never been more welcome in his world. He was credited for removing the stigma of admitting to anxiety and depression. By contrast, palace officials decided that there was no way for them to reason with a man who, quote, shared his anger in order to help others have a, quote, positive impact. Yeah, you can't reason with somebody like that because that's not reasonable. Sharing your anger and then saying, I'm having a really positive impact telling everybody how outrageously out of control I am. 
<laughs> that person is clearly in the throes of one of his many mental fits. The gulf between the Windsors and Harry was widening. Five days earlier, Harry nailed his colors to political campaigning. At Vax Live, a Los Angeles charity concert, Harry told an audience that Pfizer and other pioneers of anti-COVID vaccines should abandon their intellectual property rights and let poor countries have their patents free. President Biden supported that gesture, but it was opposed by Britain and the EU. Harry's participation would have been impossible as a member of the royal family. As would Meghan's two-minute video, she weighed in by asserting that women of color had been disproportionately affected by COVID. Women's progress, said Meghan, had been wiped out for a generation. She offered no evidence for that proposition. That is, again, not a sensible statement, as in it literally does not make sense. Meghan, okay, so many things are problematic in this two-minute video that she made. Saying that women of color are disproportionately affected by COVID can only be true if we look at the numbers and we consider how that is possible, right? If women of color are contracting COVID more often, why would that be? Is the virus racist? That's not possible. Could it be a higher rate of comorbidities amongst that population that would cause an increase in the COVID deaths of that particular population? One might wonder. But she doesn't say anything like that. And what a stupid statement to say they've been disproportionately affected by COVID. The virus can't tell the difference between black and white. And if, if there's a reason behind that, then, then do you want to maybe offer up some solutions to that? How could we make this not a reality if it is indeed a reality? Megan does not care. Uh, then to say that, oh, and because of this, because they've been affected by COVID, now women's progress has been wiped out for a generation. According to, why would you say that? What, what are you talking about? What are the numbers? Under what parameters has it been wiped out? What, 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 what's this negative prog prognosis? Can you explain it to me? Like, how is that true? What, what, what can we look forward to seeing? And what, what negative things do we need to prepare for in the future? That's a stupid statement. So Harry's over there prattling on about COVID vaccines. She's over there talking about women of color being wiped out and slaughtered by COVID, as is women's progress. You know, and both of them need to shut up. They, those are two people in the royal family who really should have hidden and, and crouched and, and loved the fact that they couldn't come out and talk politics. They don't need to. They don't know enough to say anything about anything. There's a lot of people in the royal family who I feel like could come out and say some things and be very measured in their speech and probably have a lot of good things to say. And it's probably sad that we can't hear their opinion on things. But Harry and Meghan, it was to their betterment to have had that muzzle put on them. Harry knew that the couple's political activism and the monetization of their anger was causing Charles grief. Powerless over events in California, Charles knew he had good reason on his ascension to strip the Sussexes and their children of their titles. The Sussexes' status depended entirely on their royal titles. Every appearance or statement was issued under the label of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Doesn't make sense! Neither considered it odd to honor the queen, yet damn her as a bad parent to Charles, or label her whole family as racist and neglectful of Meghan. In America, the Sussexes assumed, no one would be aware of those contradictions. <sighs> Have they ever heard of the internet? We can share information with each other pretty quick. But Harry could not assume that Charles would tolerate the enmity without retribution. In the possibly brief time before the queen died, Harry needed to cement his status. To remain in the public eye, the Sussexes organized a Lilibet website before their daughter was born. Now, you guys, I have major issues with this. Not the website, the name. It's ghastly inappropriate and totally trashy that they would take the name Lilibet from the Queen, who they despise from a family tradition which they disdain, and take that name and mash it up with Diana and now their little baby girl is going to be called Lilibet Diana. It's so pathetic. It's such a screaming cry for attention. It's so dishonoring to I mean it's like such an intimate detail about the queen that is nobody's business like what her little nickname was when she couldn't say her own name and she couldn't say Elizabeth so she called herself Lilibet and the family took that on and that became her family nickname within a closed circle. This wasn't like the whole world didn't call her Lilibet, you know? 
This is the queen's childhood nickname. And they hate the queen or else they wouldn't go around behaving this way. They wouldn't go about trashing her, calling her a bad mother, trashing the institution she has faithfully been the head of for years and been has brought so much dignity and so much honor to the woman to the role of strong female. She has done so much for women by her quiet dignity and femininity and by the way she has strongly led a country and consistently seen the straight and narrow and walked it. She has been such a wonderful and strong and beautiful person and it is the, it, 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 it was a tragic day when she passed because we lost one of the last people who knew how to carry themselves in that way. Now, Megan wants to come over and snag her baby nickname for her own self and for her little daughter. I mean, as the queen, I would have been highly dishonored by that. Just think about it. Just think about it. Think about if you think about the nickname that you have, like that your dad or that your mom called you as a kid. Think about that intimate little nickname. Now think about somebody who has destroyed your family, wrecked the the decency in your home, wrecked what familial ties you had, destroyed your dear grandson's life, twisted his mind. Now you think about that person having a baby and taking your childhood nickname. You know, I'm not much one for pettiness. You know, I just, I want to live and let live. You know, I, I really, really don't want to sweat the small stuff and I want to just move on when things aren't a big deal. You know, it's just like, we got bigger fish to fry, right? But I would have problems with that. I would really dislike that. When I was a kid, so my middle name is Denise. The only person who ever called me this was my mom. Her nickname for me was Denise. I don't know where that came from. She's the only person who ever called me that. That was my nickname. If my arch enemy decided to name their child Denise, which who would do that, but say like they did, I would be mortified and so mad because that was my mom's nickname for me. She's the only one who called me that. It was her little name for me. And if somebody decided to use that, and somebody I hated who had destroyed my family, I mean, you couldn't have set my teeth on edge any harder. Anyway, Harry didn't care. Uh, his daughter was born at Santa Barbara's Cottage Hospital on the 4th of June. On the same day, for two days before the birth was announced, Megan's lawyers registered the LilyBetDiana.com website. After the birth, but before the public announcement, Harry called the queen. He told his grandmother about the birth and their decision to call their daughter LilyBet. Look, in all truth, that is really kind of a cute little name, but it's just that they didn't have a right to it. And it's just too intimate and personal, especially when you're taking it from somebody that you publicly said you wanted to hate. And the thing that bothers me is it's just such a public way of being like, trying to like smooth everything over, be like, we're so good with, with her and the whole royal family. Like, w and, and we've just been so loving and so kind and, and have upheld ourselves in such a decent and honorable way that... It's totally fine if we use this intimate nickname for our own because everything is so good with us. You know, Kate and William have a lot of problems with us just because they're problematic people anyway, but us and the Queen are totally good. To stymie the Sussexes, the palace told the BBC that the Queen was never asked for permission for the use of her name. In his telephone call, Harry was telling the Queen about the name, not saying, would you mind if. Once the BBC broadcast that report, the Sussexes' truth machine was activated. Toya Holness, Megan's spokeswoman, claimed that Harry would not have chosen the name of the Queen had not been supportive. Fired up by the Sussexes' anger, Schillings announced that unless the BBC apologized and withdrew that report, the Sussexes would sue for defamation. Do they know how to do anything else other than hold their hand out for some money? Pitching Harry against the Queen was an extreme tactic to control the Sussexes' image. The palace supported the BBC. Faced with the factual truth, the Sussexes retreated. Schillings' threat evaporated the Sussexes were defeated. They're just so unlikable. We've stolen the Queen's nickname as a child. We just told her that's what it was going to be. We never asked for permission to use this private nickname. And it's like, you know, the Queen's a public person. Uh, so what private things she has about herself that she's chosen to keep as private? Or I don't know how private it was. Maybe people didn't know that was her nickname. I'd never heard of it, but that's not surprising. I don't know a lot of things. But it's still an intimate detail about herself. 
to come out and just use that without any kind of permission for somebody who's had to share so much of their life in in public, Harry and Meghan, of all people, should have realized how inappropriate that was. They're the ones that are always saying, how come our private things can't stay private? Yet they want to take her nickname and use it on their baby girl. And just the fact that they would put it with Diana too, it's just sickening. It's like, you guys, you know what this move is like? This is like a person who shows up wearing every brand they've ever heard was a brand worth wearing, right? And they're all a mixed mash of all different kinds of brands. And it's like a really pathetic display of desperation to be accepted. And that's what this feels like. We're going to give our baby daughter all of these names that we like. We know you guys like Queen Elizabeth and you'd even better like knowing that her little nickname was Lilybet. And so since I, we know the world's into that and into the queen and we, the queen thinks she's, you know, the world thinks the queen's great and, you know, they'll love this little intimate detail about her youth. And we know you guys really like Diana. So we're going to plaster our baby girl with these names so that you all will accept her and by that accept us. And that's what this feels like to me. All right. Uh, we've got to move on. Um, legal wrangles in London could be easily forgotten in California. They so often are. But the real thing, well, you know, forget whatever the legal problem in England is. There's always a problem in England. So we just have to move on and keep living our best American life. But what was really souring their lemonade was the fact that the whole royal family had descended on the G7 summit, which is hosted by the prime minister in Cornwall. And Kate was filmed laughing with Jill Biden. And Meghan understood then the unequal struggle for attention. Jill Biden, that's her girl, you know, the Bidens, those are her people. Everybody in the Democratic Party are her, supposed to be her people. They're not to go, allowed to go out and laugh with Kate, and Kate's not allowed to hedge in. For the British, the sight of William, Charles, and the Queen walking through a garden and alongside the world's leaders represented the monarchy's enduring strength, and William and Kate represented its future. The Windsors felt reassured by the international accolades, but the Sussexes plotted their counterattack. This is just so pitiful and pathetic. Can you believe, can you even conceive of living your life day to day based on what somebody else is doing? You put your head down and get to work. Go do things you want to do. Go live a life you want to live. Go and enjoy life. Enjoy your children. Enjoy your job. Enjoy each other. Enjoy your church. Enjoy something. But what in the world is this? What are they doing now? Oh, okay. This is going to be my counterattack. Go live the peaceful life you, you ran away to. Why are you all the way over here with your telescope watching what they're doing? You said you didn't want them. This is, this is like somebody who breaks up with somebody and then constantly stalks them on social media. So they can be re-mad and, you know, nurse old wounds and continue to rip off the scabs of the breakup. That's exactly what this is like. And it's like, why are you still paying attention to that guy? I thought you said you didn't like him. I thought that's why you broke up with him. And that's exactly how Megan is doing with Meg with with uh, Kate. She hated Kate. She says Kate made her cry, but she's going to keep watching Kate. She's going to keep seeing what Kate has, and she's going to keep comparing herself to Kate. Okay, so they decide they're going to go on their counterattack. All their future public appearances were carefully scheduled and inserted into a grid, building up to a climax later that year in New York. Their own royal event was planned to consolidate their status in America. In their timetable, the unveiling of a bronze memorial in Diana in Kensington Palace's sunken garden on her 60th birthday became a sideshow for Harry. So here they, they were going to do, they're going to unveil the statue and it was supposed to be about Diana, but no, Harry wants to show up and it has to be all about him because after all, he loved his mother the most and that's why he's the most sad about it. You know, William's been able to move on, but William's only been able to move on because he didn't love her as much. That's sort of what you're supposed to get from all that. In the bitterness sparked by the Sussexes, only the Spencer family were present alongside the brothers. Everyone else, including Diana's grandchildren, stayed away. Megan's absence passed without comment, except in those parts of America where Diana was revered. Standing in front of an uninspiring depiction of Diana, William and Harry defied speculation. The ceremony would not trigger a reconciliation. William's reluctance to attend the ceremony was well known. By then, he knew it was pointless to appease the Sussexes. Harry's destiny was built on undermining the Windsors. Harry's reinvention required a clean break, retribution, and possible reconciliation on the Sussexes' terms. The only blip was the risk of the truth emerging. And oh God, don't I just wish it would. I just wish that we could get a full look at the dossier that included all the information about the bullying accusations, and I don't know why we don't have it yet. At the end of July 2021, the Mail on Sunday's lawyer wrote to Jason Kanoff, 
She asked the official whether he might, after all, give a statement for the forthcoming court hearing against Megan. Knopf's reply arrived the next day. To avoid any challenge to his veracity, he subsequently sent a statement based entirely on his exchange of text messages and emails with Megan and Harry. Knopf's statement and Megan's later statement signaled a public somersault. Knopf revealed that he commented about Megan's draft letter to her father, and that, at Megan's request, he also briefed Omid Scobie. In addition, Kensington Palace communication team was believed to have given Omid Scobie a copy of Megan's letter to Thomas Markle. And Scobie revealed that this was the truth because later in a conversation that he had with one of Megan's friends, he was irate when the People magazine article came out because they got his scoop. He was hoping that the book would be the revelation about that letter. And then Megan sent her little lackeys out there to go and mix it up with People magazine and let them know all about the letter. And then Omid Scobie lost his scoop and he was really mad about that and told one of Megan's friends that he was. Now, Knopf intimated, the palace staff are prepared to tell the truth in Megan's trial. The other three former members of Megan's staff had also prepared witness statements. All four would challenge Megan's truthfulness. Knopf's statement was delivered simultaneously to the males and the Sussexes' lawyers. The Sussexes had good reason to be fearful. Now, that's the problem. You know, they don't want anybody to know the truth. As long as they are in control, people might still keep loving them. That's why they won't shut up, because they know they have so much to hide. Tellingly, Knopf had switched lawyers. A new firm of solicitors was also employed by the palace to investigate Megan's alleged bullying. Not mentioned in Knopf's statement was his memorandum that recorded the staff's allegation of Megan's bullying. For the Sussexes, preventing the media from publishing Knopf's truth had become essential. So, that's the end of that chapter. And we shall see where this goes. Even I don't know, since I don't read ahead. But I will say that I'm glad that Kanaf is getting a little bit more serious, but he's still so slow to tell the whole truth. I guess he doesn't want to overplay his hand, so he's letting a little slip out. And it is better than he was doing before. But is it enough to say that she lied about the mail on Sunday? Is it enough to say that she lied about Omid Scobie's book? Is it enough to say that he helped with the letter? Wouldn't it also be the right time to say she cannot be trusted. The way she's bullying everybody is a pattern. We can see this. I have a whole memorandum that this is the way she acts, you know. But I guess he just figured that wasn't the time and he'd let out when he needed to let out without saying all the sorts of things that might get thrown out and then might not be as damning when, you know. So, you know, he might, he might be right in playing a cautious hand. But I do think it's very interesting, and I've said this before, that according to Meghan and Harry, they they can have their, their truth. Knopf can't have his. The people who are bullied, they can't have their truth. Nobody's truth is correct if it is criticizing Meghan and Harry. The only truth that they will ever listen to is anybody who wants to come to them and say, we think you're awesome. And Meghan and Harry are like, you know what? We are. We are awesome. All right, that's the end of that chapter. Again, like I said, we have two more uh, episodes and then this book will be done. We've got a couple of choices here about what we're going to do next. So this was my original plan and this is the plan. I just, I, I, I've been promising you that we're going to talk about it and we haven't talked about it yet. So the plan is this. This channel has really grabbed on to the love of the royal family talk. So I said that the next book we would read was going to be all about Wallace Simpson and the abdication of the throne and all of this. And the book I've gotten for that is called Traitor King. It was highly recommended to me in the comments. And when I did some reading about it, I thought, <laughs> gold mined. So we're going to do that. It just seems like such a mockable book. I cannot even wait. Not the writing. I'm not saying the, guy, the way the guy wrote it was mockable, but like the characters and everything in it, it just seems like exactly my cup of tea. And then our weekend book. So for those of you guys who have been enjoying the Hunter S. Thompson book, um, thank you so much for being supportive of that. For those of you who say, I haven't gotten to it yet, but I will, thank you so much for that. And for those of you who are saying, it's too triggering, it's too similar to the childhood I grew up with in, it's too upsetting, Hunter S. Thompson is a drunk, he is an abusive drug addict, and I had that too much in my life, I can't get into the book, I hear you, you know, you do what you need to do. Um, but for anybody who is concerned that I'm not finishing that book, I... <laughs> rest your concerns. I am finishing it, even if I have to finish it alone, because I think it's a great book. Um, I think it's an interesting book. Um, 
I feel like I know the characters a lot better now and I feel like it's getting more and more fun to talk about the characters in the book. The only reason we didn't have a chapter this past weekend was because of the major technological difficulties I was having. And you guys, when I tell you that it was a nightmare of a weekend, I cannot stress that enough. Me and YouTube were in a big fight. Um, not because YouTube doesn't like me, but because I'm just, uh, I was just struggling. <laughs> There's so many things, you guys. I mean... <laughs> clearly not a high dollar operation right around here right and I film and edit every single thing on my phone um that ends this week I've got to get a, a laptop specifically for this but my poor little workhorse phone was crying out to me being like I can't go on any longer so I mean technical difficulties I should have been able to see that this was gonna this was gonna happen but um just because I didn't post an, an episode last weekend, uh, that has nothing to do with my inability to finish the book or my desire to finish the book. It will get finished. And we're going to go back to that this weekend. Um, but we don't have that much longer on that book. So what are we going to do on the weekend? Uh, the Kennedys, obviously. Now, the Kennedys are obviously, again, they've, I mean, they're they always in the news. Um, just because we love the Kennedys as Americans. Doesn't matter where you stand politically, they are a topic that most people love to talk about. They're a family most people are interested in. They are our royalty in a lot of ways. Um, and RFK has obviously been in the news a ton because he's running for president. Uh, but he's also a highly controversial figure. And I have selected a book that I would love to read about him, not a political book. This is not a book that is trying to get anybody to feel one way or the other about RFK, but simply because I don't know very much about him. I don't know about his background. I don't know his childhood, but I know it was bonkers. And I would love to hear about how he was raised by Ethel Kennedy because she sounds like she was crazy, like unbelievably out of control as a mother. And I would like to hear about that. And I would like to hear about how he grew up, especially because he's been in the uh, public conversation so much lately. So our first Kennedy book is going to be about him. It's going to be good. Um, but that's going to be our weekend book. So during the week, we're going to stick with our royal talk. Uh, and we're going to talk about Wallace Simpson. And we're going to talk about the Trader King. And then on the weekends, we're going to finish Hunter S. Thompson, and then we're going to read about RFK. And I'm really excited about that book, like crazy excited about reading that book. I've heard very good things about the one I've selected. So that's what we're doing. Um, thank you guys so much for sticking around to the end of this episode, and I will see you guys later. Bye-bye.